Good afternoon, my name is Cadet Second Class Maria Norman, and it is my honor to welcome you to the 28th Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium. Our guest speaker for this session is Dr. Katherine Sharp Landek. Dr. Landek is an Associate Professor of History at Texas Women's University, the home of the Women Air Service Pilots, commonly known as the WASP Archives. She's a Guggenheim Fellow at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, a Normandy Scholar, and a graduate of the University of Tennessee, where she earned her PhD. Landick has received numerous awards for her more than two decades of work on the WASP and has appeared as an expert on NPR's Morning Edition, PBS, and the History Channel. Her work has been published in the Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Time, as well as in numerous academic and aviation publications. In 2020, Dr. Landek published her first book titled The Women with Silver Wings, the inspiring true story of the women Air Force service pilots of World War II. In addition, Dr. Landek is a licensed pilot who flies whenever she can. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to present to you Dr. Katherine Sharp Landek. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Captain Wise and Colonel Thomas uh, and the NCLS leadership uh, for their terrific work to make this all happen. Uh, their professionalism, their attention to detail and their true welcoming nature have just made this a, entire experience a real pleasure. Uh, I'm honored and humbled to be a part of all of this uh, with, with the incredible speakers that you have. And I wanna thank all of you for coming out and learning more about the Women Air Force Service pilots of World War II. Uh, now I'm going to share my screen real quick here, so hopefully we can make this work. Because I always think that pictures are more fun than just me talking. Uh, you know, it was it was always fun to have just the wasp, but but uh, I'll have to do, and uh, I've got some good pictures of them to share. Now I want to start uh, with just a simple bit of basic introduction of who the wasp are, uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then I'll go into more information about some of the different individuals, uh, the different work that the WASP did during and after the war. Uh, and then, you know, kind of talk about that warrior ethos, how that they, they were those first warriors in blue uh, as, as well. Uh, so let's go to that first. Well, there we go. Uh, so, the Women Air Force Service pilots, just some of the basic facts, uh, they volunteered to serve uh, the United States as pilots for the Army Air Forces during World War II and served from 1942 to 1944. And I do want to make the point here that every woman uh, in the military that you see in the United States, uh, past or present, was a volunteer, is a volunteer. And I think that's something that uh, we should recognize and remember. Uh, 25,000 women applied to join this program. This was coming out of the golden age of aviation. Uh, people loved airplanes. Uh, it was such a daily part of people's fascination. Uh, only 1,830 were selected for training. They could choose whoever they wanted. Uh, they could choose uh, very qualified women. 80% of the women had uh, at least two years of college. Uh, just a really uh, highly qualified group of women. Uh, 1,102 women finally earned their silver wings uh, and served uh, with the Army Air Forces. Altogether, they flew 77 types of aircraft, and they flew those over 60 million miles in all these different types of jobs that they did. Uh, they ferried aircraft across the country, test flew repaired airplanes, uh, they flew non-flying personnel. There was one WASP who uh, flew the army chaplain from her base, from base to base every Sunday. Didn't go to church for 10 years after the war because she said that she got all her church in uh, as a wasp. Uh, so they just did, did all these different jobs that, that needed to be done. And I think too, it's important to remember that 38 of these women were killed uh, flying for their country. Okay. Uh, so how do we get here? How do we, how do we start uh, with, with these women? First, you have uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, you know, when the United States is struck in December of 1941, of course, they, they uh, were stunned uh, and wanted to do their part. War was declared on December 8th. 
Uh, and among those wanting to serve their country and wanting to volunteer, of course, uh, were women. Uh, they wanted to do their part as well. And there were two women in particular which are gonna shape this story uh, about these women pilots. The first is Nancy Harkness Love. Nancy Love was a, a well-respected pilot. She had a civilian job with the Air Transport Command. Uh, she had been a test pilot. She flew the Gwyn Aero Car, uh, which is one of the first airplanes that has tricycle landing gear, where everything before that, of course, had tail draggers. Uh, and she was a test pilot for that. She was a part of the air marking program, uh, helping to mark uh, rooftops across the country to help pilots navigate. Of course, all of those rooftops got covered over with a heavy brush uh, once the war started, but she was really well-respected and a uh, well-qualified pilot. The other woman who goes on to lead these women, of course, is Jacqueline Cochran. Uh, some of you may see Jackie's sword that was given to her from the Air Force uh, is in the Air Force Academy there. So see if you can find it while you're, while you're walking around campus. But Jackie Cochran was a, a very prominent woman pilot at the time. She was a businesswoman. She owned her own cosmetics company, uh, but she also was world renowned for her air racing uh, and different test flying and things like that uh, throughout the 1930s. Uh, she'd won the Harmon Trophy just really well respected. And she knew a lot of the military leaders. She knew Robert Olds. Uh, she knew uh, Hap Arnold. She had served with them on different committees uh, and at, at different aviation events. So she was very well known and very well respected as well. She was actually uh, the president of the 99s uh, just as the war was beginning. Uh, so these two women both have these ideas of wanting to do their part, uh, wanting to help organize groups of women pilots to serve uh, the nation in its, in its time of need. Uh, the armed forces, General Arnold especially, uh, of the Army Air Forces, just didn't know if women could do it, wasn't sure, didn't want to take the chance of women doing it and, and failing. Uh, so he kept pushing both Jackie and Nancy off saying, we're not ready. Until in September of 1942, we were in, in trouble as a nation. Uh, we were behind. Uh, we didn't have enough pilots. We were trying to build up the number of aircraft that we had in production. And of course, as you build planes, you need pilots to ferry them from place to place. Uh, we just needed, needed more pilots. Uh, and so finally, in September of 1942, General Arnold decided to give women the chance. Um, and he decided the first place to give them the chance was as ferry pilots. Now, these ferry pilots, they come to be known as WAFs, Women's Auxiliary Fairing Squadron. They're going to be led by, uh, they're going to be led by um, Nancy Love, who is, uh, we just talked about. Uh, Nancy was... Uh, again, a prominent pilot, and she recruited these 28 women who were all very qualified pilots. They all had uh, over, averaged over a thousand hours of flight time. Uh, they served in a wide variety of roles as pilots, and Nancy knew many of them personally. She was friends with a lot of them. Uh, it was a very tight-knit group, uh, and so these first women come on. They get a lot of very good publicity in, in the beginning, uh, pictures in newspapers and uh, uh, magazines and, and things like that. Uh, and the women ferried a number of different planes. They, uh, when they started, one of the things was the Army Air Forces wasn't sure if women could do this. They, was, they weren't sure if they could fly these planes. And so they kept them limited to very light trainer aircraft. These women all came in with a 200 horsepower rating. But they still, they had to fly the Piper Cubs uh, and, and the LTs and, and these very light trainer aircraft just to see if they could do it. Um, they very quickly proved themselves. Uh, Nancy Love herself went on and pushed the limits of, of getting into different planes, first an AT-6 Texan uh, and then others, until pretty soon these women ferry pilots are flying all of the pursuit aircraft of the day, including uh, this P-38. 
so they became very qualified and uh, very well respected as ferry pilots um, serving, uh, mainly flying brand new aircraft from the factories to the points of embarkation. Um, they would often get into these planes and have zero training in it. Uh, they they get to the factory and the factory would say, okay, we've got a P-38 today or we've got a P-51 today. And then one would say, well, I've never flown a P-38 or I've never flown a P-51. And so they'd hand them the piece of paper with the specs on it and say, you know, go sit in the cockpit till you're familiar with it and take off and land a few times. And then you can go and you can fly from California to Florida uh, by yourself with no GPS. Uh, and so these these women did a lot of really good flying, uh, a lot of seat of their pants flying to get these planes where they needed to go. Uh, and they were very good at it. The Army Air Forces, by the end, really wanted those women pilots in those planes because they were very effective at what they were doing. Uh, now, there were other jobs that they wanted women to do, uh, and there were only so many women that were qualified to serve as ferry pilots. So Jackie Cochran started the second arm of this program, right? It was one women pilots program. It had this, this ferrying pilots element. And then Jackie Cochran started this training program where she would take women who weren't quite as qualified, didn't have quite as much flying time, get them up to speed, get them more flight experience, and then feed them into those ferry pilots. That was the plan. So this is all one program. It's just, just two stages of it. And they initially trained in Houston, Texas, uh, which if you're familiar with Texas, Houston isn't the greatest place to go flying. Uh, they had a lot of trouble getting the right airplanes to fly. They had a lot of trouble with housing. This Houston was an overcrowded um, industrial city at, during the war. Uh, so they soon moved out to Sweetwater, Texas, to Avenger Field. Uh, and they served uh, uh, there in Texas and uh, ended up being uh, the first all-female training program uh, for women pilots uh, in the country uh, for the military. Uh, Jackie was very concerned about her, her girls, as she called them, and their reputation. Uh, and so she, she uh, was very, very restrictive on what, what they could and couldn't do. Uh, the women, of course, loved loved flying, but they, they, uh, they had a lot of fun with it. Switching to the next slide here. It's not cooperating. There we go. Now, I've just got a few planes here for you of, of some of the women with uh, some of the different aircraft. This is B. Haydu. This is an AT-6, uh, 600 horsepower aircraft that, that uh, they flew during their training. Uh, here's another group with a, a BT-13. Uh, those of you who know, this, this woman right here is Winnie Wood. Her niece is, uh, or was Attorney General Janet Reno. Uh, so they had that connection there. Um, now, when the women are going through their training, which lasted, uh, by the end, it lasted about six and a half months. They all had to come in with some flight experience in the beginning, they had to have 150 hours that quickly got lowered to 75 hours of flight training. And then by the end, it was just 35 hours that they had to come, had to have before they could even be admitted. But once they were admitted, uh, the training program lasted, again, by the end, it lasted about six and a half months uh, of training to get them up to speed. And they did a, a, number, of, a number of things, right? Uh, their days was split into two. Uh, half the day they would be flying. Of course, this was their favorite part. Uh, and they would get to go through all their different training cycles, primary, basic, and advanced training. Uh, they had army pilots would come in and uh, do the check rides with them. They had civilian pilots uh, often for the flight instructors. Uh, but that was definitely their, their favorite part of the day. Uh, they even had uh, link trainers, which were a type of an early type of flight simulator uh, for their instrument flight training and uh, rainy day kind of kind of training. 
the second half of their day uh, wasn't as fun to them as the as the flying was. Uh, they had ground school uh, every day. They would learn uh, mathematics and engines and weather. They all took Morse code, which was their least favorite uh, across the board. Uh, but it was all important. Uh, by the end, they were taking a lot of military etiquette courses as well so that they would be ready uh, when they were brought into the Army Air Forces proper uh, because technically they were civilians. Uh, and they always had daily calisthenics, which, which uh, again, was not, was not a popular event. They would do it uh, rain or shine, of course, uh, but they had to be strong and they had to be fit. Uh, and so this was, was a part of their part of their training. Now, as they move through this program, uh, their jobs expanded. Uh, as the women graduated in the beginning, they would go from training right into the ferrying command uh, and be ferry pilots. But by the summer of 1943, the ferry pilots had proven themselves as good pilots. The trainees were proving themselves as good pilots. And the Army Air Forces decided, let's expand this. Let's turn this into something bigger. And, and they considered it an experiment to see what women could do. Uh, so they quickly expanded it. And it's here in the summer of 1943 that you see the name change, uh, where it was always one program, just two parts of one program. In the summer of 1943, they come up with a new name. They call them the Women Air Force Service Pilots. Um, there were men service pilots. Uh, they had an S on their wings. Uh, and these women were now going to be doing a similar job uh, where they were doing all the different jobs that needed to be done flying for the Army Air Forces domestically, not in combat. So they were the women service pilots. And General Arnold was known for liking nice acronyms. Uh, so that Air Force was added in so they could be called WASP instead of WASP. Uh, and so that's that's how that name comes about. Now, one of the first jobs that they do is towing targets behind their planes. This is an image of uh, Camp Davis, North Carolina. And I think you can see how worn out those planes are. They weren't getting the best aircraft uh, to do these different jobs that they did, in part because the men who were flying into combat needed the best and the healthiest aircraft to fly. Uh, so you have you have some maintenance issues on some of these planes. Now this is towing targets, and uh, I love this picture because you can see the actual target that has been shot at. These planes, these targets were shot at with live ammunition, uh, and the idea was you've got to train the gunners on the ground how to do this. And so they um, they would tow have the target roll out from the back of the plane and the gunners on the ground would shoot at them, uh, always with live ammunition, usually color-coded ammunition, so they could see which gunner hit the target and which did not. Uh, none of the women were shot down doing this. There are rumors about that, but, but that's inaccurate. Uh, some came home with, with uh, holes in their planes, but none of them were injured or killed doing this, even though it could have been a dangerous job. I like this picture as well, because you can see you, another job they did is they towed targets behind these big bombers, uh, B-17s and others, because the gunners on these aircraft needed to be trained as well. Uh, so they would uh, uh, tow the targets behind the plane. The gunners in the back of the B-17 uh, would fire at the target from behind the other aircraft. Uh, the men would get, each get three shots, and that, then they'd be sent to war, which is just astounding to think of. Uh, for these 18 and 19 year old young men, right? Uh, another job that they did that often gets forgotten um, is they worked with some remote controlled aircraft, uh, essentially the early version of what we have as drones today. Uh, this is Lois Hollingsworth Zeller. This was out in uh, near El Paso, Texas, uh, where they had these top secret aircraft that they would fly and the women would fly in the mothership behind them and in these PQ-8s um, as the others were learning how to fly them to make sure that they stayed stable and weren't lost. Uh, so this was just one of the jobs that they, that they did during the war. 
this, of course, is a famous photo. Uh, these were women who were flying this uh, B-17 uh, and towing targets behind the B-17. They were all rated as first pilots in the B-17. Uh, the name Pistol Pack and Mamas, sometimes people ask, it was a popular song at the time. Uh, and so they, they called the women that. Uh, just a couple more big pictures that I think are fun. I like this one in particular because you can see the men uh, over here on the side watching the women march away from their planes that they had flown. Right. Uh, this, this story of uh, the WASP as well is just one other way that they were utilized during the war. Um, they were used uh, in some ways to use the sex sexism of the times against uh, or for them uh, to a certain extent. This is a B-29, which of course is arguably the most important aircraft in the Pacific War. Um, it was designed during World War II by Boeing. Uh, it initially had some serious issues, some problems. The cowlings were too tight uh, around the engines and, and um, some different materials had been used within the engines itself. They overheated and caught on fire a lot. Um, and after a particularly horrific accident by the Boeing test pilots, uh, Army Air Force's pilots were refusing to fly it. So Paul Tibbetts, who you see here on the left, um, of course, he's the one that goes on and flies the Enola Gay to drop the bomb on Hiroshima uh, to end World War II. Uh, Paul Tibbetts knew of these women pilots, and he brought in these two women, uh, Dora Dougherty Struther and Dee Dee Mormon spent three days training them to fly this huge four engine plane uh, and then took them on tour across the country to all the bases where the um, B-29 was based. And the women demonstrated the plane uh, to the male pilots. The cockpit of the B-29 is huge. You could have a dance party in there, it's so big. And so the women would be in their um, seats and men would be standing. They'd have three or four male pilots standing behind them as the women went through different maneuvers and, and trained them essentially on how to fly it. And the idea was um, it was so easy to fly, even a girl could do it. Uh, and Paul Tibbetts um, very much believed in these women pilots and felt he was playing a good trick on the male pilots to kind of shame them into, into flying it. But the men themselves appreciated it. They wrote letters later in the years after the war, thanking the women for kind of making them feel better about the plane. Uh, but that's just another way that these, uh, that these women um, were, were going to be used uh, during the war. Um, now, one of the things that I think is important to know about these women is that um, 38 of these women were killed. This photo itself shows two of the women. Um, uh, this is Cornelia Ford, uh, and this is Evelyn Sharp. Uh, and they were both killed during the war. Of course, Cornelia Ford had survived um, uh, Pearl Harbor and, and goes on and be, is killed. Uh, the WASP as a group are disbanded in December of 1944 uh, before the war is over. For those of you who know your World War II history, it was um, during uh, you know, the Battle of the Bulge, uh, but enough men pilots had survived the war, uh, thanks in part to those uh, extra tanks on the P-51, uh, that more men were coming back and they could take these jobs because it was okay for women to release male pilots for other duties, but not to replace them. Uh, so the women were sent home. They were thanked for the work that they had done uh, and sent home. Uh, in the years after the war, a number of the women did uh, keep flying. Uh, this is Carol Bailey Bosca here on the left. She won the 1951 Aerobatic Championship in the second pit special ever built. Uh, Caddy Landry Steele is there, um, and she worked at an air show, had a you know comedy routine. And this is Caddy. And yes, this is a Waco aircraft uh, with a Jado takeoff, uh, and Caddy did that in 1951. Uh, just so uh, you can understand the type of flying that they were doing in the years after the war. Um, they spent the decades after the war um, realizing by the 1960s and 70s that they had been forgotten. 
uh, they were never given status as veterans, despite the work they had done, despite the expectation and um, the, the losses that they had faced. Uh, so in the 1970s, when uh, their own Air Force said, for the first time ever, women will be flying our aircraft, uh, that really fired a lot of them up to say, don't forget us. Uh, this is a petition, you know, we have today change.org. Uh, this is a petition, a paper petition that the women gathered from across the country of signatures saying, you know, please recognize us as veterans. One of the women sat outside a new uh, movie, uh, just to give some perspective on it. There was a new movie called Star Wars uh, that she sat outside uh, and gathered signatures. Uh, but they had this huge grassroots movement. They were finally recognized as veterans. This is Dora right here, uh, the one who flew the B-29. She was one that testified uh, in front of the armed uh, Senate uh, to try to get recognized as, as veterans. And they finally were recognized as veterans in 1977. Um, they were given uh, further recognition uh, in 2009. The ceremony was in 2010 of the... Um, Congressional Gold Medal, which was a great, uh, great honor for them. Uh, in 2014, I worked with a group of people and we uh, recognized the women and their legacy uh, with the Tournament of Roses, Tournament, Tournament of Roses uh, parade float. Uh, and you can see walking alongside here are, you know, on the float are the wasps. Uh, but walking alongside here are their legacy. There are women who uh, were in the very first women in the Navy to get their wings. There are the very first women to uh, be navigators for the Air Force in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and walking along this side are others, including um, Samantha Weeks, who uh, is speaking in another session uh, at, this, at this event, uh, recognizing them as the legacy. Of, of these women pilots from World War II. Uh, the women had one final battle. Uh, the way that their um, veteran status was written, they were written as being veterans for the purposes of the Veterans Administration. Of course, they never got uh, you know, the GI Bill or Veterans Preference in Hiring or any of those things, uh, but they, they did get recognized for the Veterans Administration and could go to hospitals. And really the biggest thing they wanted was that flag on their coffin. Uh, well, in early 2016, Elaine Harmon, who was a good friend of mine, died. She wanted to be buried at Arlington National Cemetery and the, things had changed. Uh, the Secretary of the Army runs Arlington National Cemetery and he had decided that the WASP were no longer eligible to be buried there or, or laid to rest there. Uh, I was very honored to work with Elaine's family uh, and others uh, to get a bill written uh, to make that change. Uh, and we laid to rest Elaine uh, in 2016 in a very moving ceremony. Um, and the WASP would want you to remember um, more than anything else that they were the first American women to fly US military aircraft. Thank you very much.